Hello there, my name's Nikki and I am a parent support, support advisor for the Children's Wellbeing Service. And my name's Leanne Gibson, I'm a community nursery nurse working alongside the Eastleigh School Nursing Team. We are going to go through um, some information regarding sleep. Um, hopefully it will be useful and we will be able to send out and attach a booklet to it about sleep, which will hopefully give you more information. So how we can help, we can inform and support families and parents about safe to sleep messages for younger ch children. We're going to think about why sleep is important, the impact of sleep problems on children, how much sleep their, your child should be getting, common sleep issues in childhood and some top tips to help if children have some settling issues. So what are the common sleep problems that you will be coming across? Things like children who can't go to sleep. They may be saying that they're hungry or thirsty. They might be getting up during the night. They might be having nightmares. There might be some anxiety about things that are going on for them. They may be overtired. They may be scared of the dark. Everything will be what your family will be going through but it's important to think about what are the things that are reoccurring for you as a family so some information about the safer sleep principles and some key messages so we, with our um, school nursing service, one of our important things when we're working with parents of uh, new babies, um, so more so the health visiting services, that we share the safer sleep principles and the key messages. So we explain to parents that, you know, co-sleeping and bed sharing is a very personal choice. And some children, uh, some parents rather will tend to do this with their children. Um, and that is OK. But actually, we need to make sure that if parents are co-sleeping, we need to make sure that we are sharing that safer sleep message and advise them of when co-sleeping can be dangerous so that we know that if either parent or partner smokes, even if they don't smoke in the bedroom, um, it can increase the risk of cot death or SIDS. Um, so we need to make parents aware so that they can make those informed choices about whether they should be co-sleeping with their children. Uh, if either parent or partner has drunk alcohol or taken drugs, then actually this will include prescribed medications that may cause drowsiness. So things that, you know, you may be taking um, because you have a health condition that might mean that you're not going to wake as easily as you would if you weren't taking that medication. Um, we do say that actually the safest place for baby to sleep in the first six months is in a separate cot or a Moses basket um, in the same room as the parent or carer and baby needs to sleep with their feet at the end of the cot or the pram or Moses basket and we always need to ensure that their heads and faces are uncovered. We also ask that um, we're not putting any bumpers or anything like that around the cot um, this can lead to dangerous situations so we need to to have that awareness as well um, and you will find that when you have had new babies there's lots and lots of information out there about um, various sleep aids um, and sometimes these sleep aids look like a pillow with a bump around the side but we do advise you not to be using anything um, like that when you have your uh, baby or or young child in their cot because it can lead to suffocation. Um, we need to be aware that if either parent or partner is extremely tired, you may um, find it more difficult to wake up. So then again, we need to make sure that, that the child is sleeping in the most appropriate place. Um, and if your baby's been born prematurely, so 37 weeks or less, or was born a low, uh, born a low birth weight, so um, you know five and a half pounds or less, again, this can increase the risk of um, cot death. So we need to have that awareness. And um, one thing that we would say not to do, and I know that can be very difficult as a parent um, of a new baby because we can fall asleep on, you know, the drop of a hat, but co-sleeping on a sofa or an armchair with a baby can increase the risk of um, sudden infant death by up to 50 times. So please make sure that if you are feeling extremely tired, that your baby is placed in the most appropriate place. 
Thank you. So how can we in the 0 to 19 team support you um, with sleep issues? So we run a chat health messaging service. So we have three different chat health messaging services. The first of these being the chat health 0 to 5. This is a text service that we have set up to support parents and carers and families of the under fives in Hampshire. It's run by local health visitors and supported by community nursery nurses both of whom have a wealth of experience working with mums and dads to be, babies, toddlers and young children. And we can see that the, um, the text messaging service number is shared on there. We also have Chat Health 5 to 19. So again, this is a different text messaging service for parents of children from the ages of 5 to 19. The Chat Health Advisor team is made up of school nurses and again, supported by community nursery nurses. These nurses have an extensive wealth of experience of working with and supporting parents of children and young people. Um, and that is the telephone number there for you to be able to text to. And also our chat health 11 to 19. So this is a really simple and convenient and confidential, as are the others, text messaging service for young people in Hampshire aged 11 to 19. This is supported again by school nurses, again, who have an extensive experience of supporting young people. And that is the text messaging service number at the end there. So Chat Health is open from nine o'clock in the morning till 4.30, Monday through till Thursday. Um, slightly shorter hours on a Friday, so nine till four. Uh, this does exclude weekends and bank holidays. However, if any parent or young person texts outside of these hours, they will receive an automated message with advice of where to get help if their question is urgent. So we tend to signpost to either 111 or we'll give other advice. The team can support with a variety of questions relating um, to a wide range of health issues, including healthy lifestyles, toileting, behaviour, sleep, emotional health and wellbeing um, conditions, as well as signposting to appropriate services and other support. And that's very similar for the health visiting text messaging service as well. And then the chat health 11 to 19. So young people can be offered support with questions relating to a variety of different um, health uh, concerns, such as self-harm, relationships, bullying, any weight concerns, anxiety, drugs, smoking and alcohol and sexual health. And again, the team will be able to give advice as well as signposting to other appropriate services and support. Why is children's sleep so important? We know that sleep is, is essential to support children's development. We know that well-rested children are more able to meet their full potential in every aspect of their, li of their lives. During sleep, growth hormones are released and our body's immune systems are strengthened. The brain is able to make sense of the day, our memory and concentration functions are increased and our bodies rest and our emotional well-being is restored. So every living creature needs to be able to sleep. The circadian rhythm or the sleep-wake cycle are regulated by light and dark and these rhythms develop at about six weeks and by three to six months most infants have a regular sleep pattern. Our body's temperature and hormones change throughout the day and it's with this cycle that we are able to know what, what is day and what is night. Sleep is especially important for children as it directly impacts their mental and their physical health. So when we're talking about the sleep or wake cycle, um, it can be quite easy to knock that body clock off its off its keel, so make it a little bit skewed. We often see this with children that will fall asleep later. They fall into a pattern of that late sleep, then well, that will move on to that late waking in the morning. Once we kind of get stuck in that cycle, it can be a bit trickier to fix, but not impossible. Um, so there will be some things that we can talk about later around the, how we bring that body clock or that sleep wake cycle back to where it should be. When you receive this, you'll be able to just click on the link. This is quite a fun little cartoon. It's quite useful to show our children so that they can begin to understand why sleep is important. And if you're in the process of trying to change a routine or help your child to go to bed if they're struggling with that, doing these things little and often can be really useful. 
So Maslow is a really good way of helping us to understand the importance of sleep. So along the bottom there, we have physiological needs which need to be met in order for us to reach that top of that pyramid for us to be able to reach our full potential, which is what we want for our children. So our basic needs are things like making sure we have food, we have shelter, we have warmth and we have sleep. And that is about being consistent sleep. We all have the odd night where we don't sleep particularly well. But this is about an important sleep pattern which ensures that our children has consistent sleep. If we are able to do that, if we are able to have those physiological needs met, it means that then we're able to move up into our ability to feel emotionally safe. If that is in place, then we are able to move up into our social needs and that is being able to form attachments, uh, make friendships, being able to um, develop um, those skills which are really important for our children as they're getting old, as, as they become older. The next part is our ability to have a good self-esteem and feel good about ourselves and to be able to be resilient and manage things that go wrong. If all those things are in place, then our children will meet their full potential. But it is about getting those building blocks at the bottom there right. We want our children to be able to learn, we want our children to be able to love and to be able to be the best that they can be. So it's about thinking about the building blocks. The, 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 the physiological needs are need to be in place first. We often see um, that when our sleep pattern is disturbed or when we have a long term sleep issue, that it can have quite a huge effect on our self-esteem. So our ability to um, manage our daily routine, our ability to manage our learning within school, within preschool, um, even, you know, before that, when we're babies, the ability to kind of learn new skills is really quite badly impacted if sleep is, is is, is off skew. Um, so, you know, what we're hoping to be able to do today is just give you some ideas on how to manage those sleep issues so that they are going to be able to have that building block where it needs to be. How much sleep is recommended for our children? Thinking about us as adults and as parents, I think sometimes it's important to reflect on how much sleep do we actually need? I think we often get caught up in a cycle of our children aren't asleep for 12 hours. If we don't sleep particularly well ourselves, sometimes that can impact on our children. So it's, it's important to recognise our children's sleep pattern in relation to what our habitual habits are. For a normal child, kind of between six and 13, we would expect them to sleep for nine to 11 hours. But that is about um, thinking of, I can't, I'm losing it here a little bit. <laughs> I think with, with what we do need to be aware of is that that is a guide. So we know that that nine to 11 hours is kind of an ideal brilliant but you're going to have some children that are going to cope really well on seven hours sleep and then you're going to have other children who need that 12 13 14 hours sleep sometimes and it's the same as us as adults you know there are some people that can coast through life coast through the day having only had six hours sleep the night before and then there are others that actually they need their full eight nine ten eleven twelve hours sleep so it's just about what do we need to know? So we need to know that this is an ideal amount of sleep for our children to have. But actually, not every child is the same. So you know your own children, you know, maybe not exactly how much sleep your child needs, but you know what what she can kind of focus well on. Or, you know, do they need to be having more? Do they need to be having less? What does that routine look like? So it's just a bit of a guide. It's also worth thinking about when our children are, are they difficult to wake up in the morning? Are they children who struggle to wake up and get to school rather than a child who is up at six, half past six, bouncing around, ready to go for the day? So that that kind of thing is also worth, thing, is worth it thinking about. Children who don't get enough sleep will often feel more anxious and irritable anyway. So it's worth thinking about that as well.
So this is considering a hypnogram of a normal sleep pattern. So at night time, we experience different levels of sleep and we sleep in cycles. So this series of sleep stages occur several times each night. So the REM, the rapid eye movement, and the non-REM sleep are different stages, but both essential to keep us healthy. And this is an example of how these cycles occur. We get our sleep, our deep sleep towards the beginning of the night and our lighter sleep is in the early hours of the morning. After each, slide, after each sleep cycle, we come to a point of partial awakening. And it's at this point, if we've got children, that we need to think about them, their waking up. So children would normally, or what we would like them to do is that that partial awakening is roll over and go back to sleep. But it's worth thinking about how did they go to sleep to start off with at the beginning of the night? Did they go off to sleep with you rubbing their back or with the fan on? What was the environment like for them when they first went to sleep? Because when they do the partial awakening, they're looking for that to be replicated. And if it isn't, it's really hard for some children to then roll over and go back to sleep. Uh, yeah, it's really it's really common, I think, um, for us to expect as parents, our child to fall asleep at X time and to wake up at Z time. So, um, and that's often because we, maybe as adults, can sleep that whole night, um, but, but we don't. But what happens is we just don't recognise that we've had those periods of wakening that you can see on that hypnogram. We do that self-checking where we wake, environment is OK, I'm safe and I roll over and I go back to sleep. Um, it is completely normal for children and adults as well to wake around about four to five times during the night. Um, and as Nikki said, it's what we do with that when that happens. The children who've not learnt to settle themselves are the ones who may be the ones who may wake fully up at this point. And it's worth thinking about what was that environment like for them when they first went to sleep. A complete sleep, sleep cycle is when we pass through three stages of non-REM sleep and the stage of REM sleep. And the cycles vary depending upon the age of your child. I like this one because this explains it, you know, absolutely appropriately. As Nikki said, if we are doing a certain pattern when our child is falling asleep, if we're having to lay with them to fall asleep, if they're having to have a nightlight on to fall asleep, if we are rubbing their back to fall asleep, um, that will often need to be replicated during the night. So if you have a look at this hypnogram, it says child falls asleep with you rubbing her back. Um, they go into a lovely, nice first stage of sleep. So they go into that light stage, then into that deeper stage. Then they come up and they have their dreaming stage and then they wake. However, when they've woken, you've probably gone to bed because it might be gone midnight at this time, which is their first stage of wakening. So the environment is different. So if you're laying with them when they fall asleep and you're not there when they wake up, they are going to fully wake. They are going to come and find you. They are going to call for you because they need to be able to get back to sleep. That replication of what was happening when they fell asleep initially. This is often called sleep onset association. Um, and this is where children just form a bit of a pattern. So you effectively become their dummy or their comfort blanket. Um, it can also be something as simple as they fall asleep with their nightlight on. So they might not need you to lay next to them. They might not need you rubbing their back, but they fall asleep with their nightlight on. We as parents, we go around, we turn all the lights off, you know, close the doors. Nightlight goes off when they fully wake, as they will do. Again, the environment is different. So we advise parents, however they fall asleep is what they need to wake up to in the night. So that can be really tricky if you are the person laying next to them. So that's why we look at how we can do that separation of them needing you to be with them to fall asleep. Because if it's something as simple as a nightlight, nightlight can stay on all night so that when they do naturally wake, nightlight's on, environment's the same, I can roll over and go back to sleep. So there are different stages of sleep, as we've already said. 
there's the non-REM sleep and this is when our child the stage one part is when our child goes into a very light sleep where they're easily awoken and that's when we as adults will probably be trying to tiptoe away and tiptoe out of the room and our child will suddenly wake up and you go oh my goodness me no we need to go back and try again um it takes around 15 minutes for our children to move from stage one into a deeper sleep. So stage two, they're still quite a light sleep, but their body is preparing for a longer and deeper sleep. Our child will be more relaxed now. Stage three is when they are going into a deeper sleep. And this is where the, our children's bodies will, re that reparation and that repair can take place. And they may be harder to wake at this point. It's at this stage that some children will experience night terrors or sleep walking. And that as they move from this deep sleep back into the lighter sleep. The REM sleep is when we dream vividly and our eyes will move underneath our eyelids. It takes approximately 90 minutes after we first fall asleep for this stage to happen. Our brains become very active, but our bodies are much more relaxed and can't move. Um, so with the stage three sleep, so our very deep sleep, this portion of our sleep happens most in the earliest part of the night. So um, if we were thinking back to that hypnogram, children often go quite quickly through the um, first stage, second stage into the third stage, and then you'll see a nice big lump of deep sleep. If you have a child with a sleep issue who struggles to fall asleep until a lot later, we often find that what can happen is that child will then not end up getting enough deep sleep. Um, and deep sleep is really important. As Nikki said, this is where our body repairs itself. This is where our immune system kicks in. So it fights against any infections or bugs that we might have come, um, you know, face to face within the day. Um, so it is really quite important that we get into that nice bedtime routine to enable and do those things to enable our child to fall asleep at an appropriate time so that we know that they are still getting that decent amount of deep sleep because as the night goes on those periods of the deep sleep get shorter and shorter um, so we just want to enable them to have that the best sleep that they can. So impact of sleep problems on children. We all know that when our children don't sleep, it's really hard for us to function as parents. Um, but for children, they are more likely to lack concentration. So when they're at school, that learning might be a little bit trickier for them. They might struggle to follow instructions. They may be flitting around because they just can't, can't concentrate on one thing. They may have a reduced capacity to recover when they're not when they are ill, if their immune system isn't um, getting the sleep that it needs and it's not able to repair and it's not able to do the things that it needs to do when we are sleeping, then when they're unwell, sometimes children can take longer to recover from that. Some children can have an incorrect diagnosis of things such as ADHD because they're of the lack of concentration, the fact that they are um, Flitting around, can't follow instructions. They could appear to be more high, hyperactive. So it's worth considering what is our child's sleep pattern like. Their daytime functioning of just normal um, everyday things that they might be expected to do could be impacted. Their academic performance, we may feel that our child is more than able to cope with school. But actually, when they're in school, they may really struggle with the collaborative skills that they might need, the resilience that they might need, the learning ability that they might need purely because they have not had enough sleep. Their behaviour may be impacted because they may feel lethargic. They feel, may feel like they can't be bothered to do things. And then when there's an expectation from adults for them to do things, they will get out of it in any way they can. That's where that poor behaviour can come in. Like I said, some children can be quite lethargic. Um, some children can become quite anxious and worry more if they haven't got enough sleep. And this can affect their development because if a child isn't 
the growth hormones aren't working when they are growing and they're not being repaired and they're not um, developing when we're sleeping, um, that can also affect our children's development. I think also um, when we look at that slide, you know, you see that little chappy who's like, I'm tired. And, and mum's looking in the mirror and she can barely keep her eyes open. So as parents, you look at that list of things that can um, be impacted with our children. We are in exactly the same space because we are sharing that child sleep issue. Um, often as parents, when you have a child with a sleep issue, those nights where they sleep really well, we still don't because we're expecting them to wake up. So it's almost like we, you know, the minimum of sleep that we get, we can get. Um, so the, the lack of concentration, the reduced um, physical capability to recover from illness, possibly not the ADHD, incorrect diagnosis, but all the other things, they're gonna impact on us as parents too. So our ability to be able to support our child um, are going to be, a lot narrower because we also are suffering from sleep deprivation and sleep deprivation you know if you think of uh, in some countries sleep deprivation is used as a form of torture so actually we need to be careful that we are able to sleep well alongside our children too absolutely and our capacity to manage everyday life can be drastically impaired when we don't get enough sleep so most common bedtime issues, um, some things will be will be here, but what will happen is we'll send out a booklet as well, because if the issues that you're finding aren't covered on this slide, there is other ways that we can send you out that information. These are the most common things that we come across. So a child getting up and just, I need a drink, I need something to eat, I need to go to the loo, what's going on, um, I need a hug, all those kinds of things, a child who's persistently getting up and coming back to you. Um, just being, holding that boundary, it's bedtime, gently leading them back to bed. It needs to be completed more than once. So we need to keep on doing the same thing and same thing over and over again. If we allow our child after the fourth time to stay up, what we're doing is we're building up their resilience to stay up four or five times or get up four or four times in the night because you're then giving them what they wanted in the first place. I it's really, we, sorry. sorry, I was going to say it's really important that as the adult we can stay as calm as possible. Think about your capacity but it's important that we stay as calm as possible and we are consistent. We mean what we say and we say what we mean. If we want our child to go back to bed, we need to make sure that we are we keep on doing it and taking the back because that's the only way they're going to learn the message that that is what needs to happen. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Nikki. And um, I use it as it and is it oh, can't even speak. An example um, with many parents that I work with, um, an example of my children, I'm a mum myself, um, of returning one of my children to bed 48 times one night. Um, we'd just gone from a, to a toddler bed with a side guard into kind of a, a big boy's bed where he could get up and he did um, a variety of times and actually I knew that I needed to be consistent with this so we did the first night we returned him to bed and I think it was 48 times the next night was less it was around about 30 32 times um, the counting helped me because I wouldn't have been able to see that it was getting any better. And I'm absolutely not saying that your child is going to be as um, determined as mine was. Um, but just to think to yourself, do you know, I need to be consistent with this. Because as Nikki said, if your child is getting up and after the fourth time you give in, what that enables them to do is think to themselves, OK, so mum or dad gave in or parent or carer gave in. And next time you might hold out to the seventh or eighth time but because we've given in before they will keep going so we need to be consistent and that can be really tricky if you're on your own if you're dealing with it as a single parent it's okay for you to come out of the room it's okay for you to take some time take a deep breath count to ten go back again start afresh 
So, you know, if you have someone else that you can pass the buck to and go, do you know what, I, I need some time, your turn, so that they the child can also then see that you are both being consistent. Actually, you both mean business. Um, it can just be making it in your mind. I know that I need to keep going. I know that I need to keep returning them to bed with minimal conversation. So don't give them anything. It's the payoff often is what they're looking for. What do I get from this? Do I get a drink when I ask for it? Um, you can't really deny them going to the toilet because you never know. But it's done without any conversation, um, making sure that all those things that they might ask for, they're given before bed. So they've had that snack if they need that snack before bed. They've got that drink in their bedroom. All the teddies are in their bed. They've had that last hug. They've had that last story. And that's it. It's bedtime. If you're going to do something like this and you are going to start making sure that you are consistent with them make sure that it's at a time where you are able to manage it and that you are not stressed out and your capacity is there to manage because if you are in the middle of a really really bad week um and you suddenly decide right that's it he's gonna he's gonna stay in his in, in his room tonight um that might not be the best time to start so think about what your capacity is and when you can follow it through So our children who get into bed during the night, again, like we said right at the beginning, that might not be a problem for some people. Some people are quite happy for their children to wake up and come and get in with them. It might depend to you on what time that is, whether it's one o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning. Um, but actually, it's what you are able to tolerate. What is it that you want to happen? If you're OK with this, that's fine. If you're not, then think about what you can do to help your child to manage this better and again this might be going back to um, that partial awakening your child has partially awakened and decided that it's not the same as it was when they first went to sleep so they're coming to seek you out they need that reassurance they need to know that everything can go back to how it was when they first went to sleep so think about, again, that environment, then obviously not able to self-sue. So we need to think about how we can get our child to be able to self-sue so that when they do wake up, um, they can self-sue back to sleep. And again, this is just a case of returning them back to their bed. So they come into you, OK, minimal language. Let's go back to bed and getting them back into bed. And like Leanne said, if it's 48 times to start off with, it's 48 times to start with. But things should improve after that. It's just giving them that consistent message that, yeah, we want to cuddle as well, but not now. We need to go back to bed, but just not um, not giving in, because if we give in, then we are building their resilience up for that to happen again the following night. Um, and as Nikki said, you know, co-sleeping is uh, a personal choice and in um, many, many different places in the world, it's it's what's done. Um, and in, in Britain as well, in, in many different areas, for many different reasons, co-sleeping works really well. Um, but I often say to parents, if it's not something you want to stick with, so if it's not something you want to continue doing, then to consider making that change. Because what we will say is the longer it happens, um, the harder it is to break. So if you think of, you know, getting yourself stuck in kind of a habit, that habit is harder to break the longer that habit goes on. So just to be aware of that. There's a, um, a step ladder plan that will add to the resources for, for you. Um, and that is a really good way of thinking about what is it we want as our end goal. And that could be our child sleeping in bed all night but we need to take those rungs we need to take those baby steps to get there and that's a really good resource that you can use to think about how you can manage this how you can break this kind of thing down into bite-sized pieces to make it more achievable for you and your child to get to that goal which might be them staying in their bed at night it's not going to suddenly happen overnight it's about thinking about how we can break it down and make it achievable and often if you're making that change, what you might find is that the behaviour gets worse before it gets better. Um, so if we have got into a bit of a habit of no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. Yes, you can. 
um, and you've decided, right, we're going to be consistent and we're going to we're going to follow this through um, because you're making that change. We often find that behaviour worsens. Please don't think that that means it's not working. It just means that we need to be consistent for longer. Some children do suffer from night terrors or uh, nightmares or sleepwalking. What's really important is to be watchful as a parent during these episodes to help keep them safe. Try not to wake your child. If they are awake, calm and reassure them before returning them to bed. There is additional advice on um, NHS website about night terrors, but also in the book that we will be supporting this uh, workshop with, there is more information about night terrors if that's something that your child does. I think we also we often panic if we've got uh, more than one child sleeping in a room um, and they are likely to wake up their sibling. I think that that is when, uh, as parents, we become quite anxious and we're like, oh no, God, I don't, you know, you can be awake, but please don't wake everybody else up. And I think that that is a big thing for lots of parents who have more than one child sleeping in a room. And it's really helpful to teach our children if they share a room what they should do when they go to bed. Um, so when they're settled, it turn out the lights, it's time to sleep. Some children struggle with the word sleep, so actually it's time to rest can be a really handy tip to use because that word sleep is a bit like no for some children and it makes mm -hmm. them uh, get quite upset. Stay in the room by the door with little interaction just to reassure, reassure them. If you do this consistently, again, it's like that step. So we stay in the room, then we perhaps move to the door, then we perhaps move just outside the door, um, just to help them to get used to that routine of self settling and going to sleep. Some parents put a reward system in place at this point to help our children to recognise that they are making good choices. Um, and it's a little bit of motivation to help them to stay in their room, stay in their bed and not wake anybody else up. It's about planning it. It's about being um, being consistent, being resilient and making a plan of how you're going to do this. When we have um, children going through some of these co common bedtime issues, if you have um, fallen into a pattern of where your child needs you to enable them to fall asleep, so they need you laying with them, sitting with them, being in the room with them, there is something called gradual retreat, which is a quite a, a gentle way of being able to remove yourself. Um, however, it is hard work and it does take time. Um, but gradual retreat, and again, when you receive the booklet from us, um, that will also tell you a little bit more about how it works. But I'm just going to kind of touch on the basics with gradual retreat you start where you are so if you're having to lay in bed with your child to enable them to fall asleep that would be where you would start so you would lay in bed with your child until your child has settled and fallen asleep and you would do that consistently for a period of two three nights um then you're going to be sitting on the bed so rather than laying with your child you're going to sit on the bed and you're going to do that consistently for a period of two three nights then what we want you to do is to move next to the bed. So sit by the side of the bed. What the actual idea is that eventually you're going to be out the other side of that bedroom door. But it's just little bit by little bit by little bit. Um, because for a child who's not used to self-soothing or self-settling by themselves, just to kind of cut yourself off. You know, one night you're there laying and the next night you're putting them to bed saying goodnight and leaving the room um, is really, really quite difficult. And it goes back to that breaking a habit. Um, so this is a more gentle way. What I will say with gradual retreat and the reason that sometimes it can take longer is if something happens and you are almost outside that bedroom door um, and there's a spate of illness or your child has a nightmare and you end up back to where you were in the beginning, you have to start the whole thing again. So um, it can take longer, but it's just a more gentle way of enabling your child to be able to self-soothe and self-settle. So what does work? What is helpful at bedtime? So in principle, we all know that we need to have a um, healthy bedtime in place for our children. 
sometimes impacts of work, impacts of life will, will happen, which means that it isn't happening consistently. And it's that consistently that the, the consistency that's really important. So going to bed at around the same time every night is really, really help, helpful. If a child and you are on holiday, if it's the summer holidays, whatever time it is, weekends, still going to bed within that hour is really, really useful because if we suddenly allow our child to stay up three hours for a couple of nights, it's really hard to then get them back to, say, an eight o'clock bedtime. So it's about thinking of making sure that our bedtime stays within the same time. Make sure that we're preparing for that bedtime. Make sure that, that there's a calm activity, um, dinner, make sure that that routine is consistent. It may be that every night at six, six o'clock, whatever they're doing, you, you, you stop, go upstairs, have a bath or a shower, then do something nice together, get into bed and you um, read stories so that you know exactly when your bedtime is going to start. Make sure that that time is consistent. Make sure that the bedroom itself, the environment of it is not too stimulating, that it's not a place that's used that they go to when they're being um, when there's a consequence for some for something, because they can then it might not be that nice, relaxing place mm. that we want it to be. We want their bedroom to be somewhere that is relaxing and they feel safe. What can be really helpful as well is um, you as parent laying in their bed. So looking at what their room looks like, you know, if you have a child who is frightened, doesn't like the dark, is always telling you that, you know, there's something scary on the walls or they can, there's something in the cupboard, lay in their bed at bedtime, have a look, see it from their perspective. Is there a shadow? Is there a lighting, you know, that you think from, from an adult perspective, you know, standing up looks absolutely fine, but laying in their bed, it looks completely different, looks like a scary monster. So, you know, really take in what their bedroom is like, because often it can be something that's simply fixed. It might be a case of removing that dressing gown off the back of the door. It might be a case of making sure that the bed, the, the closet doors can shut properly. Um, you know, one thing I will say is try not to enter into their fantasy world um, with the monsters under the bed. Don't check, because <laughs> if you check, you're saying to them there might be something there. So, you know, just that gentle reassurance, you're safe, I'm here, you've got nothing to worry about. So, yeah, just making sure that that environment looks the same to you as it does to them. It's also worth thinking about that for our children, if they, their temperament is quite sensitive and they might be quite an anxious child, that sleep separation is huge for lots of children. It's the longest that we're apart from, from them. They don't necessarily know what's going to happen. And that's why the environment needs to feel safe to them. They need to know what is happening and they need to know what that feels like. And that's why that routine and predictability of a bedtime routine is so important. Things like audio books, mindfulness apps can work really, really well. But again, it's thinking about that partial awakening does it get turned off just before they go to sleep or do they go to sleep listening to it? Again, have worth think, thinking about that. Some children, a white noise like a fan or some kind of noise can be really help, helpful for them to be able to sleep. Um, all electronic devices should, should be turned off at least an hour before they go to bed. And that includes TVs, computers, games, consoles and mobile phones. The blue light from the screens is a massive stimulation to our children's brains. And although we might say actually it's off, it still can be if you've got a TV in the room and you leave it on, that can still stimulate our child's brains, which makes it harder for them to go to sleep. The way blue light actually works is um, it has a huge impact on our melatonin levels. So um, the brain gets a little bit tricked because it thinks it's daylight outside. So the way those the blue, blue light waves kind of go into the brain, the brain thinks I don't need to release melatonin. So melatonin is our sleepy hormone. It's a hormone that we all release at the appropriate time 
to enable us to fall asleep. Um, sometimes that can be released a little bit late. Sometimes that can be released a little bit early. So you've got the child falling asleep at the dinner table. Or sometimes you can really have an impact and delay that um, by being on these computerised um, objects before bedtime. So when we're thinking about what could be um, wrong with our child's sleep routine, you know, if you may have the loveliest bedtime routine ever, you may have, um, you know, it being consistent at the same time every night, the same at weekends. However, they they are watching a, a computer screen, you know, half an hour before bed. And it sometimes can just be that that tips that melatonin into, I don't need to be released yet. So it's just having that awareness. How does become involved in a quiet, relaxing activity, colouring, drawing, building a jigsaw in the lead up to bedtime? Um, bath can be helpful, but for some children, they can be quite stimulating. So think about whether your child gets really hyperactive after a bath and they start running around or whether it is something that is quite relaxing. But again, it should be at least half an hour before bedtime. The bedtime routine it sh itself should last about 20 to 30 minutes and it should have an end point. And that end point should be you saying goodnight and leaving them. Turning the light, light, the light out or leaving the night light on, whatever your routine is as a family, but have an end point to what that is. And again, preempting, like we said before, preempting what we know they possibly might get up for. Do they need to go to the loo? Do they need a drink? Have they had everything that they need have they got all their cuddlies like Leanne said uh, uh, earlier is everything as it should be for you to then be able to leave and you know there can be lots of things that will impact on sleep when your child is unwell that obviously is going to have a massive impact on sleep and you may have a child that never needs to sleep in your bed however goes through a period of illness um, and has had to be in with you because maybe you're keeping an eye on their temperature you want to make sure that they're okay and that is absolutely appropriate you know when your child is unwell when your child is going through a period of unrest for whatever reason they might need that closeness of us and that's okay it's just making sure that when that period ends so when things have improved we are back into that routine and the same goes for holidays you know absolutely we're not saying that you can't go on holiday with your child and you know your child has to go to bed at seven every night we are we know that holiday times are going to be different but what can be really helpful is you still follow that same bedtime routine so it might be at later times because of whatever you're doing on holiday but you're still going to do things in the same order that then means that when you come home it's easier to slot back into that bedtime routine it might be that you're going to go back to the normal bedtime but you've been doing that bedtime routine it's a movable feast bedtime um, routines can go anywhere with you um also when they go for sleepovers at you know relatives, grandparents, it can be really helpful for them to have an awareness of what that bedtime routine looks like at home. Again, we're not saying that it's going to be perfect because it's going to be different people doing it, but at least if there's a guide around it, you know that that can be taken anywhere. It can be used at home, on holiday or on sleepovers. Okay, so this next one, um, Again, the link is there for you to look at in your own time. So thinking about, again, what does a bedtime routine look like? Sometimes having something up, something visual can be really help, helpful um, just to give your child predictability, just to help them to know what is going on. Um, some children need that more than others. Some children don't need something visual, but actually, for the whole family, just knowing what's going on um, is really useful for our children. This is more examples of some visuals that you could get your child to do. So if you've got a child who's really struggling with that bedtime routine, actually having something like this where it's velcroed on and you, they, they, they can move it around um, can, be, can be great. And actually having a reward system perhaps attached to it as well so if they can do four out of the six things fantastic they get they they get a reward it's important that they understand that they're trying and that trying is just as important as anything else it might need some support with some of it but 
having that visual there can be really help helpful. One thing I'll say um, about bedtime routine, just as an awareness, is um, when we're thinking about what their bedtime looks like, and, and some children might need that bedtime drink, so some children might need that, that drink of water, you might have a child that absolutely detests water and will only drink juice or will only drink milk, um, have an awareness of what they're drinking and brushing teeth. So when we're looking and talking about brushing teeth as part of that bedtime routine, if you have a child that likes juice or if you have a child that likes milk, we need to kind of ensure that that's done before the brushing of the teeth and 30 minutes after that last milk or juice drink. Um, the reason being just good oral hygiene. Um, we do know that there needs to be around half an hour left between a snack or um, a, a sugary drink or something like milk, because what we can do if we're brushing teeth straight after is that we can brush all the sugars into the enamel and it can lead to cavities and damaged teeth. So just have a think, you know, if your child's drinking water, it's absolutely not an issue, but if they're drinking other things, we might need to tweak that routine so that the brushing of the teeth happens 30 minutes after. So just look at that when you're planning your routine. Again, thinking about our capacity to parent, if we're really stressed out and we are rigid in our bedtime, it can be, become a very stressful time for our children, which means that then going to bed and the bedtime routine can be really challenging for everybody and it becomes a huge, a huge thing. Um, so your attitude to that is really important. It's really helpful if we can think about being quite playful, um, loving, accepting, curious and empathetic. And that isn't about stimulating our children and playing games and running around um, with them. It's about just accepting that they are little and that we need to help them to manage these, these situations and being playful with them. Sometimes making it into a game is going to be easier and better than being really strict. And this is the routine. This is what needs to happen. And us, because our capacity is overflowing, making it a difficult time rather than a happy time. Mm -hmm. So some top tips to share. Um, so children who are physically tired will sleep better. And I've spoken to some parents and say, not always, um, but it's, it, for most children, um, if they are, have they been outside, if they've been active and not been playing games inside a lot of the day, if they're physically tired, they generally sleep better. There can be a difference between that physical tiredness and the overtiredness. So we as parents need to be aware of those tiredness cues because uh, you're quite right, Nikki, you know, some parents will go, actually, do you know what? I can run them around all day and my goodness, they're bouncing off of the walls and the ceiling when I'm trying to get them to bed. If they've dipped into that overtiredness, it's almost as though the body pulls every resource um, it can to keep going. So you have a child that maybe 10, 15 minutes ago was falling asleep during their tea, is now overtired um, and it has that opposite effect. So it can make them hyperactive, overactive, um, a little bit too bouncy, shall we say. So just be aware of those cues. So it's lovely having that lovely sleep routine in place. But if you're doing that sleep routine with an over child, overtired child, um, it's going to be a lot harder to get them to settle. So look for those cues. Do you need to bring that sleep routine forward because they just can't get past seven o'clock or can't get past eight o'clock, depending on the age of the child? So as much as possible, it's helpful to spend some quality time with your child before bed. And that special time that you give your child at that at that time is really beneficial in your connection bonding your relationship um, and and just being able to connect. Really difficult, I know, if you're a single parent with, with more than two children, but just trying to make them even five minutes before bed can, can have a massive impact. Um, as we said before, as much as possible, avoid computers, TVs or video games an hour before bed. Um, 
because as we said about the melatonin and the blue light issues. Be clear and firm about bedtime, not strict. There needs to be some flexibility, but keep that bedtime routine in place um, and, and just be consistent with that. Make sure that they have had that drink, teeth and toilet before bed. Um, make sure that environment is as it should be. And like Leanne said uh, earlier, just just laying in their bed occasionally and looking around is a really good indicator of what they're facing when they go to bed. Encourage them to settle and sleep in their own bed. Again, if if co-sleeping is something you're doing, but you don't want to continue, think about ways that that is going to be able to happen. Be patient. Um, it isn't going to fix itself overnight. It's about starting it and being consistent with it when your capacity isn't overflowing. If you can involve others for support, amazing. Um, not always possible, but it can be really helpful for you to have that support in place as well. Um, establish that good routine and stick to it consistently. Give your child lots of praise when it goes well and acknowledge their efforts. So trying is really important. We want our children to feel successful. We don't want them to feel that they are being blamed for the night going wrong. So let's praise them for when things are successful and that is going well and just try and tweak it when perhaps it isn't. And I know that Nikki said about, um, you know, you might want to establish a reward system around bedtime, um, which is a really lovely idea. Um, just be aware that this is tricky for them. So there are going to be those nights where they struggle and they can't settle and they go a little bit haywire. Um, so it might be that you're rewarding them with, for example, a marble jar or a sticker chart. So that conversation in the morning is, do you know what? I could see that last night was really tricky for you. Never mind. Let's try again tonight. So that what you're doing is you're acknowledging to them. I know this is hard, um, but we'll get there. We're going to try again tonight so that they know that, you know, what we don't want to be doing is, well, I told you and now you can't have a marble and you can't have a sticker because what you may find is that they give up before they even get started. Um, and also making that reward system achievable. If you're thinking of doing a marble jar and you've got a lovely big jar, don't expect them to fill it. So you might want to put an elastic band around the outside and once they've reached that band, they get a bigger reward and it might just be an extra bedtime story or um, it might be a movie night, um, you know, with the family and then make it achievable, move that band up so that they can keep going. The reasons we find that reward systems don't work is often because it's too big a target so they've got to do too much before they get that reward. So often it's like that. I find that I look at that huge mountain. I know I can't even get halfway up, so I'm not going to try. Or we get bored as parents and we forget to do it um, or they get bored. So, you know, we just need to have that awareness. Keep it interesting. Don't put days of the week on there. So if you want your child to achieve um, five nights of sleep before they get a reward um don't say they've got to do five nights in a week they haven't got to do monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday because if they don't sleep tuesday night then it's gone for the rest of the week what we want is for you to say perhaps um for them to be able to do five nights that might take two weeks to do but that doesn't matter because they are trying um and just remove all days of the week from it um, some helpful websites are there for you to have a look at as well. What I'll do is I'll make sure that when you receive this, you have the resources attached that we've spoken about. I hope you found this helpful um, and good luck. Good luck.